my name is Vinicius. Um, I'm a field engineer for Pivotal, but before joining Pivotal, I was actually working at Warner Music Group. Um, and there I was the lead architect for the engineering team. Uh, I worked with Brian McLean, and if you guys saw his presentation prior to this, uh, I was the, his counterpart on the development team. So this presentation is about some things that I've learned when I was there in trying to get our applications into production, right? And what does it really mean for you to develop into Cloud Foundry? Um, to give you a little bit more about my background, uh, I've been working with Java for the past 12 years. Um, and I work from startups to large corporations like Ericsson. Um, I've been an architect, a engineer, a product owner, and scrum master. But at the essence, I like to think myself as I'm a developer. And that's, that's the reason I love Cloud Foundry. Uh, I first heard about Cloud Foundry back in 2011. Um, and since then, I, when I look into Cloud Foundry, I say, hey, this thing is awesome, right? This thing can actually make my life easier. And I was blessed that I was part of Warner Music when they, they started their journey into uh, actually getting Cloud Foundry as the platform of choice. And to me, when I look into Cloud Foundry, I see this, right? You, if you're a developer, you get Cloud Foundry, it's your super power up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in reality, um, and someone already made this joke before myself, uh, with great powers comes great responsibility, but it's, it's true, right? What Cloud Foundry will do with your team, if you're an enterprise architect and you, you wanna uh, start using Cloud Foundry as a platform, it raises the bar, right? Because you get all these neat, cool things that you guys have been uh, you know, hearing about, which is self-healing, right? Uh, HA, uh, push of an application in, in a, you know, one line of code. So, for you developer out there in architect, it means that you have to raise your bar. Now, you don't have that excuse when your boss calls you and say, hey, why do we have so many problems in your code? And you say, well, I don't have time to do that because I'm worrying about infrastructure, right? You really need to start pushing yourself harder. And the, the challenges that we faced when going to Cloud Foundry, uh, one of the first of them was that in large distributed systems, the failure actually is a norm, uh, it's not an exception. Now, the Hadoop guys know this quite well. Data Grid guys know that quite well. But if you're trying to embrace the microservice architecture, that's gonna become you know, your norm as well. Uh, and again, Cloud Foundry is a reliable platform. It has HA and self-healing. But the question is, does your code is, support that? Are you ready for, for that type of, of things, right? Uh, the next thing is you give the developer a great experience to push applications. You have a nice console to check your services and binding services. They'll come back to you and say, I also want a better experience of my APIs or the APIs you're providing to me, right? Um, and how, how can you enforce security and access control of your endpoints? The service discovery, right? And how can you avoid duplication? And Guys, I know a, a lot of those things here, they are recurring topics in our industry, but one thing I can tell you is, everyone has uh, duplication of code in their companies. That's, that's a norm. Now, if you have that with your developers taking weeks or months to push applications, how, fa how much duplication do you think you can have when they can push applications in a matter of hours, right? So if you don't start tackling this problem at the very beginning, it's gonna come back and haunt you, right? So I'm gonna start talking first at, about the experience, right? Uh, and I'm assuming here we're building REST services, just, just for the sake of this presentation, right? So if you're really building REST services, right, it means that you're using curl a lot to consume your applications. Uh, your developers are gonna come back to you and say, hey, why can't you give me this, right, which is an API explorer, right? Foursquare has it, Twitter has it, I mean, you, your platform has that. I can have a nice console. Why can't I consume my services like this? So it actually turns out that you can, and you can use something called Swagger. Um, so 
Embracing Swagger was one of our uh, initial thoughts. You can have a nice UI to consume your endpoints. Swagger is an API description uh, for REST services, but it also has jQuery plugins, right? So that was the first step. It's like, okay, I give you an endpoint, I give you an API to consume, you go to your browser and you can actually use it. It makes much nicer experience for developers to start consuming the services you're building in your infrastructure. Um, and now we're talking about services, right? If I could take a constellation and mimic services, this is what I pretty much can say that any co corporation has those days. Uh, you have these clusters, right, where they're probably the core business services, and you know about them, and you, you're, they are documented, people know what they're doing, but what about these guys here? Who the hell are them, right? And every company has that. And, and, and yesterday, I was talking to two friends of mine, and they were discussing about the legacy, and I said, hey, we have so much legacy in our company that I don't know who is using those services. I might as well you know, turn off the switch of the, some machines, wait a couple of weeks, and see what happens, right? Um, and, and guys, you're starting a new landscape, right? You're starting with a pass. You don't want to repeat the same errors in the past. You want to make sure that you have all those things you know, documented and where they're stored. Now, Cloud Foundry gives you part of that when you're doing uh, the application deployment and the console, but really what each service is, uh, you need a service registry, right? And then that was the next thing that we had to build. Uh, so I understand that Cloud Foundry supports, uh, has a service registry, actually. A service broker is a service registry. But here I'm talking more about service registering in the sense of a REST service registry, okay? Uh, so we start with uh, uh, something in a, in a tree architecture. Uh, you have services, instances, and API endpoints. And for each endpoint, you add some metadata. Uh, um, <clears throat> I got inspired actually by Apache Curator. They have a nice service discovery for Zookeeper. Uh, so if we're talking about <clears throat> the API, uh, Swagger has a convention that there's an endpoint forward slash API forward slash API docs that describes your endpoints. The next thing is you do have some endpoints there, like get users or put a user by ID. Now, that's where things get, start getting interesting. If you can start putting security metadata for your services there, where you say, okay, for the get users, for a given client ID, I want to allow a group of uh, set of rules to access that endpoint. And note when I talk about client ID, I'm really talking about OAuth client ID, right? I'm going to touch the UA part in the, sh in the short term. Um, but if you're really thinking about building services that are going to be consumed by multiple applications, they might have different roles per application. You want to store this here and not in your code. You might add some UI metadata, right? I mean, uh, if you're really building widgets, uh, reusable widgets, you might need some uh, hints on how you want to present that given they're consuming a service. Uh, quality of services, right? You might want to be limiting your API calls and billing as well. So all this information, and you can do whatever you want here. It depends on your, your corporation. But you do have a nice you structure service registry where you can count on having all the services and the metadata associated in one place. Now, building this should be pretty simple. Pick a, a database of your choice, and you write it, you have it. The next part is how do you discover? How do you make discovery you know, possible? So you guys might have seen this slide before. Uh, it's a short version. So let's say that I push an app. It's on my DEA now. It's, it's, it's ready for, for action. Um, one approach would be make your application go to the service registry and say, hey, I'm here. You can get, grab my metadata, right? Uh, but this actually leads to a problem. What if a developer forgets to call the, the registry, right? I mean, binding the registry should be easy. It can be just a, a custom user-provided service in Cloud Foundry. So another approach could be make your registry calls the cloud controller. There's an experimental API for events. And one of the events is app create. So once an application gets created, your registry go back to your application and say, OK, now give me back the metadata. Now your registry is populated with all the information. And you have the registry part. So we have the registry. We have a, a nice API description. How can you actually enforce that those things work? Okay. Um, there's tons of ways of doing that, right? Um, 
if you're just doing Java code, you could just bundle a jar with your service and use that information. So for example, you use Spring Security for the security part. But if your services are built in multiple languages, not only Java, right? Uh, one idea is to have a service proxy, right? And the service proxy is just an HTTP proxy and turns out to be a NETI pipeline. So NETI is just, is for you, for those who doesn't know who NETI is, NETI is this fantastic NIO project that a lot of cool things are built on top of. React or TCP, Elasticsearch, they all rely on, on, on NETI. It's pretty simple architecture, right? So the user send a, a request, right? Uh, the proxy will intercept that, get the metadata for that endpoint. It will validate the credentials. It goes to UA and say, okay, check this token. What, what does this token have? Can you just use? And the token that comes back from UA will have credentials for that specific user. Uh, it then applies some other filtering on, on the chain and finally calls the user service, right? User service will say, okay, here's the payload back. It sends back the payload. And what it could do as well, the first you know, handler is a data filter, right? And a data filter, all it does is, I know who you are, I know what roles you have, you cannot see one of the fields. So I'm gonna filter that out and I'm gonna send the data back to you. So now you also have a, a, a data security in your platform. Uh, there's many ways of doing that, this is one of them. Uh, you could also you know, try to change the query on the fly. Uh, I'm not a particular fan of that because you have to understand a lot of you know, parsers and bear in mind if you have multiple data stores, you have to rewrite your query on different data, data store providers. Uh, the next lesson was security and I, I don't wanna dive too much in security because it's a huge topic, but uh, do, do, not rely, do not use LDAP for authorization. Uh, and the, the lesson is corporate LDAPs can be very polluted. Um, so do authentication on the LDAP or any SSO appliance you might have. And I'm talking about UA here being your SSO uh, platform. Uh, but move the authorization part back maybe to UA, maybe to a separate database. Uh, because now you have this fantastic platform where you can push code in a matter of seconds. If you rely on LDAP, it means that you have to open a ticket again, request a group, take some vacations, come back and then you might have your group. So you push your app fast, you don't have the group and LDAP at the same speed. Uh, to enforce security to go you know, all the way through all the services, and we're talking about microservices here, you're gonna have a lot of services all over the place, make sure that you pass the token along, right? So each service that you have must get the token and propagate to the next one. So there's a pseudo code here that doesn't really work, but uh, a simple example if you use Spring Security is if you go to the security context holder, you get the context, you get the token from the, the, the call, and then you just pass it along as a, a header to the next client that makes a REST call. Right? And that, that is pretty much what I have to talk about security because that's a huge topic and I don't wanna dive in this. I don't have time and in, in, in the expertise to, to, to talk into that. Um, but you, you guys probably were in the you know, Madenstein microservices uh, everyone was there actually, right, a talk, and it was fantastic. Uh, but there's the dark side of microservices, right? And then there's no, uh, if you play Portal, there's no cake. Uh, and what we found out is multiple remote calls that you're gonna start having on your, in your, in your architecture, and ent entity relationships. That one hurts, and we, uh, it, it hurt really bad, actually. So two weeks ago, I was reading an article by this guy here, I don't know, Chris Richardson, if you've ever heard about him, but if you know the Cloud Foundry history, you probably heard about him. Um, so he wrote us uh, an article about microservices, and he was talking about how uh, a solution on solving some of those problems, and I was in joy when I, when I, when I read that, because hey, that's what's exactly what we're heading to, right? I mean, so I wasn't you know, going crazy or something. And when you're looking in the architecture for microservices, you can see something like this. It might look like this. At the bottom layer, you have data services, and data services are as close as you can get to CRUD operations. Core services are services that are complete agnostic of your business. It could be a push notification service, it could be an audit service, or a profile service. 
You move up, you have business services. Those are tighter to your, your business units. And then finding an application orchestrating all that. And if you can notice, uh, the number of calls are just increasing as you go down, right? So it means that the response time will go up, right? So you have to be prepared for that. And how do you deal with that? So how I dealt with that is we, you launch an application, and the application is built on Node.js as a front end, and the back end is complete Java, and you're just sitting waiting for the page to render. And you're wondering what went wrong. I mean, I'm using Node, right? It's supposed to be fast. Um, you open the code, and you see something like this, right? Every single invocation of the services, they've, they are just in, uh, sequential. So you're paying a penalty of the remote invocation call. But you shouldn't be writing code like this, right? Uh, now, just a message to myself here. I'm not on Scala days. I'm on CF Summit. But you should be writing code like this, right? If you really want to embrace you know, reactive and making parallel execution calls, we made a choice for, hey, what if we write code in Scala? I mean, it doesn't have to be Scala. You can actually write code and, and compose futures in Java and uh, just live by the callback nightmare. Uh, it's up to you. But evaluating some, some choices, right, that uh, um, what we have out there, there's a bunch of frameworks you can think about it, right? It's, there's Akka, Rx, Reactor, and Vertex. And they all kind of solve the same problem, right? The idea is um, I want to have a parallel execution, and I don't want to pay the penalty for you know, di distributed calls. It just turns out that Akka had a nice feature built in uh, that you guys probably heard about it, and it's a circuit breaker, right? So not only it saw the actor model solved the, the parallelism problem we had in composing uh, rem remote calls, it came with a, a nice circuit breaker as well. And it works with Java. Uh, being a huge Java shop, there's no need for you to switch to Scala, actually. Um, so that was one of you know, our thoughts when moving to Scala. <clears throat> if you look into the, 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 the next problem, right, it's the traditional web application. And uh, it, it doesn't matter if, if you're talking about ERs or WARs. As a developers, we are used to this. This has been built in our DNAs for almost a decade now. This is how we do things. And what I want to highlight is how Hibernate you know, handles uh, entity relationships. So you're used for, uh, to have Hibernate to propagate cascading operations for you, and they happen at the same JVM. You move into a uh, microservice architecture. How can you make those things work? And then to me, that it's what I'm calling the ripple effect of entity relationships. Uh, your data services, when you change one service and it's starting propagating all the changes to different related entities. And here I'm talking about resources, okay? Those are the, the, at the bottom layer, the data services layer. And the top layer you solve by using Vertex or, or Aqua or uh, Reactor. You choose one of those frameworks. But at the bottom layer, what we decide to, to do is, hey, why don't we go event-driven, right? There's, there's a nice uh, uh, architecture for that, and there's an awesome product called RabbitMQ. So we just embrace the message-oriented pattern and say, instead of having to tell the others, why don't I just propagate an event, and who else is interested in that? They can take care of themselves. And I stop blocking the caller. So the caller, caller is never blocked anymore, right? So we got a lot of agility there. Um, but if you're really serious about exposing your services to the external world, it might happen that you don't want to expose the AMQP protocol. A uh, few things that could be done is you can have server sent events. So if you have a nice server that behaves nice with NIO, doesn't block by threads, and it's OK with long polling, um, you can publish your events on the web for external entities. You might have partners that want to be listening for events or for entities as well. Um, or you can embrace the webhooks uh, idea, right? Just like GitHub. And there's a very nice project called PubSubHubBub. Uh, yeah, I always want to say that in public. Uh, 
It, this project is by Google. It's a webhooks implementation. Um, it tells you how to build you know, brokers for, for webhooks and, and so. And, and finally, but, but, but last but not least, uh, was the whole problem of polyglot persistence, right? So everyone is polyglot when it comes to persistence these days. Uh, so traditionally, what you would do is you have your service, and, and it has a, a bunch of repositories, you know, Spring Data repos. Uh, and don't take me wrong, I love Spring. I love Spring Data. Uh, but what's, what's happening here is if it turns out that you need an, ex, an extra uh, type of repository, and believe me, when you go into the NoSQL world, that again becomes a norm, right? Uh, uh, you start adding everything on Cassandra, and then one day you realize that, hey, my developers are doing uh, relationships in Cassandra, and all the queries are taking too long. Um, so why don't I put my relationships on a, a graph database? And there's a nice pattern out there that people use is Solandra, right? They combine Solar with Cassandra. Um, but you might be doing Elasticsearch. So those things will pop up. You don't want to be in the business of every time a new uh, storage engine pops up, you have to open your services and add the repositories there. So again, same concept of event-driven uh, architectures, right? Uh, persistence is no longer done by the data service, right? And I think that we've just created the, the nano service where we got a microservice and we split it over smaller sets. Um, services just put into the data pipeline uh, a JSON request. And JSON is as good as it gets. Uh, yesterday, Dave McRory gave a, a nice presentation on the future of paths and data. And he was talking about how JSON might be the good solution for a uni you know, universal uh, format for storage. Um, each one of those uh, implementations, Redis, Neo4j, or Elasticsearch, or your Hadoop data lake, they'll know how to, that data make it fit, right? It, it knows how to you know, fit the, the square in the octagon. Um, but you might need a, a few more information. And this approach, it actually turns to be nice on another, um, Another phase uh, facet. Um, so different different providers they offer different SLAs, right? So Redis, we all know Redis is blazing fast, right? But <sighs> Neo4j might not be that as fast as they advertise. I'm not saying that, but you might have uh, you might not ha you may not have a, a fast engine there, and with this you can have uh, a different number of instances of those services. To, to keep up with the throughput of your messages, right? So I can have only one instance for Redis because it's too fast, but I might need three or four instances for Neo4j to handle the traffic that is coming, right? So I think that uh, that was one of the, the last uh, lessons learned when uh, there was uh, a lot of things. One thing I can tell you guys is um, if, you, if you're embracing Cloud Foundry, uh, if you're looking for a pass, you, you have a lot of things to do to raise your game, you know, start thinking a little bit different on, on how you deploy your architecture. Uh, I really think that this is the first time we're gonna get service-oriented architecture right without having to spend half a billion dollars in tooling. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, I'm gonna thank you guys and just welcome to the next level. That's pretty much what this is all about. So.